السلام عليكم مساء الخير hello everyone thank you for coming to this uh, some, this very special seminar i have to say um, because uh, we have a very special uh, speaker and uh, first is uh, david christie is a very special speaker because of uh, first he's he was um, he's in robert gordon university he's the uh, academic strateg strategic lead uh, in robert gordon university and he uh, for for many years he was heading the uh, construction law and arbitration uh, program in the university um, uh, how many here in the audience are are uh, familiar with rgu you can raise your hand okay so there you have it uh, david so i was just telling david he has a lot of fans in in egypt so we, we've been communicating through that on on, on via email um, so I, I personally was a uh, an RGU graduate. I joined RGU, the Construction Law and Arbitration Program, the Online Distance Learning Program uh, in 2006. I graduated in 2009. At the time, uh, I think I was the only uh, Egyptian uh, from Egypt who was there. And actually, if 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 you uh, if you know Ahmed Al Mansouri, uh, who was uh, heading the SCL uh, Egypt. Uh, just, just, just me and Ahmed actually. And Ahmed was in Dubai at the time, and then since my graduation in 2009, I think the RGU, uh, you know, uh, students, the people who joined the RGU for the construction law and arbitration program in specific grew, and and think by now, uh, not just in Egypt and Egypt and the Middle East, they have grown uh, a lot. So, and it actually, it's not just the construction law, by the way. There's also project management and 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 so on and so forth. Um, the the, the uh, second thing, why why David is a very special uh, guest here, is because David is also the head of the uh, CIR uh, uh, Northern Chapter of the Scottish bra branch. And actually, I think that how long, David? I think it was it's, it's been three years since actually we've been trying to do this CIR Scotland slash Egypt collaborative event. So actually, this is a, a uh, historical moment, I think. <laughs> um, <coughs> the second, OK, this, this is why David is, is really, we're very, very happy to and privileged to have David with us here speaking on this topic. Uh, and also, this seminar is also special because of the topic itself. So as, as uh, you all know, uh, we are governed by the Egyptian Civil Code. The Egyptian Civil Code has uh, Article 148, uh, which talks says that uh, all contracts are governed not just by their express provisions, but also alongside with the contract, you have the principle of good faith that is mandatory. But then again, you have actually three principles that are mentioned in the code, which is uh, good faith, uh, justice, uh, equity, yani, and uh, usage. And um, I think that's that's it. Uh, yeah, the, the law, usage, and equity. Al-Qanun, Wal-Urf, Wal-Adela. And that those three topics actually run, run alongside the express provisions of the contract. Uh, and they, they are a sequel to the contract. So the contract is not just those words that we sign. It's actually those three run alongside the contract. So maybe, and this this is not just Egypt. This is actually the MENA region as a whole. And um, as you can agree with me, I'm sure David agrees with me, these are very intangible conceptual concepts. So if you sign a contract and you have these governing the contract, so what, the, what is exactly good faith? What is exactly equity? What is exactly a or, or or usage or custom? Uh, and their effects can be substantial, of course, in any contract form. Um, on the other hand, and I know this because I've studied uh, in, my, in my dissertation, my, my PhD, I, I, I went into the topic of good faith, trying to compare uh, Egyptian law with, uh, with the uh, British English law as far as time bar clauses are concerned. Um, the perception is that uh, in the UK, we don't, you, they don't have this. In the UK, it's, it's the, law, the, the, the contract terms, express contract terms govern. So there is no such thing as uh, good faith being overriding the contract provisions, unless, of course, you have a contract form that specifically mentions that this, govern, this contract is governed by the principles of good faith or 
mutual trust and cooperation. All, uh, for example, like the JCT contracts, for example, they have they can have these these terms, and if you have these terms in the contract, then courts in the UK will probably will take this into account. But uh, to have a principle overriding the express contract terms is not really the perception, at least that it's in the UK, it, it would not be really uh, enforced. So. So where does the UK law, when it comes to this issue of uh, good faith, and of course there's another important issue, which is if if a, if a contract if an employer delays a contractor, for example, at the at the towards the end of the project, um, it's a well-known principle that the employer cannot benefit from his own breach, and therefore uh, cannot say hold the contractor liable for damages, for example, because the, the employer is the one who delayed the contractor. This is called the prevention principle. And actually, it is a variant of good faith as well. Um, so, and of course, this leads to another topic, which I'm sure you're all aware of, is that if this, if this delayed the contractor at the substantial completion of the project, then in, in UK terms, time can be set at large, and um, and then, of course, we're talking about here concurrent delay, so we're talking about a bigger topic. So, where exactly does the UK stand um, in these in these uh, you know concepts uh, when it comes to good faith, uh, concurrency, prevention principle? Uh, that's really how why this lecture is unique because David is going to uh, put the spotlight on that. I don't want to take more time. Uh, I want to thank David again so much for for coming, and I uh, it's over to you, David. Salami is that right? Yeah. I, I've never even I've never been brave enough to try that before. That was very good. So <laughs> thank you very much. Um, yes, prevention principle in UK law, and uh, as a Scotsman, I use the term UK very advisedly. There are at least two jurisdictions within the UK. There is Scotland, then there's England and Wales. I think the Scottish angle. Uh, if we get to it, it might be useful in terms of some of the civil law discussion because um, Scotland is a mixed jurisdiction. It uses some traits of the common law and there are some traits of the civil law too. So there may be a distinctive Scottish approach which could be, at least from my academic point of view, interesting in terms of considering the prevention principle uh, as it applies and how it may translate into a civilian system. Maybe I've fallen asleep. No. There we go. So some of the things to think about today, um, uh, these would be the learning outcomes from, from the talk, because thinking about the scope of the prevention principle as an important rule in construction law, uh, understanding the way that common law principles develop in English law, because that's obviously something that doesn't happen in, in the Egyptian system because you have the civil code, or it does happen, but in a different way. There's the idea of legal transplants, which is where you take an idea from one system and try and apply it in another. Uh, as I mentioned already, there's the possibilities of the different approach from a mixed system of law. Uh, and again, that feeds into the idea of how good faith, the civil law and the prevention principle might interact. And why is that relevant? This work is based on my current research paper. It's therefore perhaps relatively academic. It might be quite detailed. Um, but the importance to you guys, if you're not academics, if you're working in practice, that these are the ways you can try and think about building your arguments if you have to make a claim, uh, or if somebody comes to you, how you analyze that claim, or how you predict how an argument might be run if you were to run it in a claim or it was to be run against you. So while it may all be happening up here at, in the jet stream level, you can bring it down to reality if you think about these in terms of arguments. And one of the things to ask me questions about at the end is if, if you don't see how that might be relevant to you, then do please ask, because I think it's important that you see where this, this academic stuff becomes real. Um, before I start, I thought this was quite an interesting way in in terms of Robert Gordon University and our mission. Um, I had to do some research a few months ago because we had some Americans coming in and they wanted to know a little bit about the history uh, of the university, a little bit about the history of the Scottish legal system. Uh, and I found this reference in a paper which is to Arthur Gordon, uh, and we're called Robert Gordon University, but Arthur Gordon was Robert Gordon's father. 
And while Robert Gordon University has only been in existence since 1992 in its own in its own right as a university, it has roots going back to Robert Gordon's time, which was in about 1730. And Robert Gordon was a merchant. Robert Gordon's father was a lawyer. And uh, the way that Robert Gordon, uh, Arthur Gordon, sorry, qualified to practice law in Scotland was that he'd studied the laws both at home and abroad. And I thought, well, there's a great uh, message to take out. The, the father of the, ba the, the guy who founded the university didn't just study law in Scotland. He actually went abroad to see how things worked. So even in that background of Robert Gordon, there must be some appreciation of international law. And Robert Gordon himself was a very successful international businessman in his day. Where are we now? Um, well, um, as Dr. Waleed has already said, as uh, I met Dr. Sharif Al Hagen this morning, and he said, you know, if you if you if you want to hear about Robert Gordon, ask me, ask me, ask Waleed, ask any of us. Um, but Julian Bailey, who's a partner at White and Case, uh, told me this by email the other day, uh, that he meets all the time uh, people who have completed the construction law program, and some of you I know are in this room, uh, and they all have positive things to say about it. And it's deservedly got quite a big international recognition, but I'm sure you know that already. And I'm sure I hope that all of you know that by now. I'll skip over the advert, since I think we've probably made the point enough. Um, and the other thing to say is that this talk tonight has been largely inspired by uh, my interactions with, with Egypt and Egyptians. Both uh, Dr. Walid and his colleague, Dr. Salva Fawzi, gave webinars to our alumni where they discussed these issues. And they took what had started off as a relatively standard case comment on siding against North Midland homes, which we'll come on to in a bit, uh, and made me think much more deeply about some of the academic uh, ideas that came into it. So some of these ideas about what the Egyptian civil code said lie in the background of my thinking uh, just here. So, so this is really a, a great, this is really the spiritual home for this subject for me, um, because it came from these webinars that we did. So. The prevention principle. The questions that I'm going to try and answer, and please, if you don't think I've answered them, come back to me and tell me, are what is it, where does it come from, and how does it arise? The key definition, or the key, the key definition of it is uh, this, uh, 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 this passage from a, a decision by uh, at that point, Sir Rupert, uh, J Mr. Justice Jackson, Sir Rupert Jackson, who went on to become a Lord Justice of Appeal in England uh, in a case uh, between Multiplex and Hanuel against the construction or about the construction of uh, the Wembley Football Stadium in London. And he said that if the employer has, by act or omission, prevented the contractor from completing by that date, time becomes at large, and the obligation to complete by the specified date is replaced by an implied obligation to complete within a reasonable time. Um, so that, I think, is my starting point in terms of what it is we're talking about when we talk about the prevention principle. And one of the things I think is particularly interesting is, to, is the use of the word replace there. And what does replaced mean? How does, how does the date become replaced? I think that is something that we'll come back to. But the principle goes back um, beyond Multiplex and Honeywell, which is about 2007. Uh, there is this passage from a judgment by Lord Denning, famous English judge, uh, where again, I won't necessarily read it all out, but um, he talks about time becoming at large uh, here in the, in the end. If you can't complete, if it becomes impossible and practical for the other party to do his work within the stipulated time, then the one whose conduct caused the trouble can no longer insist upon strict adherence to the time stated. Time becomes at large. So, in terms of what is it, it's the idea captured in these two quotes that if you can't complete by the time stipulated in the contract because someone else has done something wrong in some way, then time becomes at large. There is, however, and I don't know if this has been fully picked up yet in the literature, a, a disagreement between two weighty authorities about when the condition is engaged. Those authorities are uh, Mr. Justice, Lord Justice Jackson, who we've already been introduced to in terms of his dictum from Multiplex and Honeywell, and the other figure there is uh, Lord Justice Kim Lewison, uh, and he has written the leading text on interpretation of contracts uh, for English law, and it's also very relevant in Scots law because the Scottish courts have also referred to it. So this is a weighty text, because not just 
the sort of rubbish that I might write. It's something that actual judges are actually applying in courts. Uh, and he seems to have a slightly different approach to uh, Sir Rupert Jackson's approach in the case law. So when we look at Jackson in Multiplex against Honeywell, he referred to the prevention principle being capable of arising uh, through actions by the employer which are perfectly legitimate and they may still be characterised as prevention if they cause delay beyond the actual com contractual completion date. So he is referring there to perfectly legitimate actions. In Lewison's textbook, um, he says that the implied term is limited to the active prevention of performance and probably does not extend to passivity in the face of action by some third party. And then he goes on to say the act complained of must itself be wrongful, either as being a breach of the express term or implied terms or wrongful independently of the contract. So there seems to be between those a significant difference, at least in emphasis. In Lewison, he's looking at active and wrongful conduct. And in Jackson, he talks about perfectly legitimate actions. So the question of when it arises is at least one of the gaps in the overall situation. In terms of the position as it's evolving in construction law, uh, we have this decision of the English Court of Appeal in uh, North Midland against Sidon Homes. This case is, is largely discussed because of what it says about the concurrent delay position. And that feeds into the prevention principle and the prevention principle feeds into that. Um, but it's also quite interesting because it does do something to narrow both the scope of the prevention principle and probably limit the opportunities for uh, further cases to come which might help clarify it. And I'll come on to the reasons for that in a minute. I think the background is worth covering here. Um, this is the house that was at the centre of the dispute. Um, Sidon were the family company of, um, of a builder called Jeff Dyson, who's not related to the guy. I don't know if you have Dyson um, vacuum cleaners and hair, hand dryers. It's not the same family. I thought it was. That would have been good. But no, it's a builder called Jeff Dyson who was building this house. Uh, and North Midland were the contractors. And the claim... Uh, went in for delay and there was discussion about whether there would be concurrent delay and the concurrent delays would have been if it came to it which we'll come on to um, that the contractor was slow in dealing with the roofing and the lighting um, and that there was poor weather coming on the employer side which also slowed down the contractor so these are pretty conventional concurrent delay type situations where you have weather on the one hand and contractor poor progress on the other. You'll see if you think about what Lewison says, poor weather isn't uh, wrongful conduct by the employer. So the Lewison definition there doesn't seem to be what people are thinking about, at least in construction, as to the sort of thing that gives rise to uh, prevention. Although this was in the case of concurrent delay. But that shows, I think, these are not unusual points for debate, particularly these are pretty standard delay claims in construction, yet the Lewison approach would seem to strike that down as a, as a possible cause of pre prevention. In Sidon, the discussion, as I say, was about concurrency, and so the contract provided that any delay caused by a relevant event, which is concurrent with another delay, uh, is responsible should not be taken into account. So that was an amendment to the JCT standard forms, and the big question was whether that amendment would contract out of uh, any concurrent delay claims, um, or whether the prevention principle would mean that that, um, that clause was ineffective. Uh, and the decision was that the amended term was clear, which I think, at least to my to my mind, it couldn't be much clearer about what it's attempting to do. Uh, and so that then the prevention principle is not engaged. Uh, Lord Justice Coulson gave the leading judgment in Sidon, another leading construction judge. And he said that the prevention principle is to be treated as an implied term. Uh, there was some discussion about whether it was a, an independent rule of law, whether it was something that just sit, sat within a slightly intangible quality within the law. So 
essentially some sort of not quite good faith type principle, but something sitting in that area of the underlying understanding of what the law was supposed to do. But Coulson said, no, it's not that. It's an implied term. Um, so therefore, the prevention principle does not override the terms of the contract because it's only an implied term. The contract itself had an extension uh, of time mechanism within it, so it complied with the rules that were set out in multiplex, which we've looked at. And that really the prevention principle doesn't have any particular interaction with concurrent delay. The question then to my mind is if the prevention principle is an implied term, <coughs> where does it come from? Because I think that's something that you need to be clear on and it might help deal with the question of whether or not there has to be a wrongful act or whether it comes simply because something has happened outside of the control of the uh, employer. How interested are people in concurrent delay? My next section is on concurrent delay, but I'm, I'm happy to, I've got quite a lot to get through, so I'm, I'm, I'm relaxed if people don't want to hear about concurrent delay. You all want to hear about concurrent delay? Oh well. Um, so concurrent delay, what is it? One of the great things about Sidon was it took this definition, which was given by John Marin QC in a talk to the Society of Construction Law about 15 years ago, and it approved this definition. So we now have, in the case law, Court of Appeal Authority saying this is what concurrent delay is. And he said, a useful working definition of concurrent delay in this context is a period of project overrun which is caused by two or more effective causes of delay which are of approximately equal causative potency. This is quite a narrow definition for concurrent delay. Um, which means that, in practice, if a court is asked to decide whether something is concurrent delay or not, it's going to be quite easy for them, I think, to say that it's not concurrent delay and therefore avoid having to discuss the question of concurrency. So for you people who are my RGU students and who are thinking of concurrent delay for your dissertation, it may no longer be the source of dissertations that it has been in the past. D David, uh, just a question. Can, yeah. can you just elaborate on what he means by uh, approximate equal causative potency? <laughs> that last just few words. <laughs> I, I'm asking that, by the way, because in, in both the SCL uh, and the uh, AACE, yeah. there's two types of concurrent delays. There's something called literal concurrency, where it's, it's exactly yeah. the same start, exactly the same finish. And there's functional, where it's uh, they both affect the independently the critical path, but, but uh, one starts before the other. There's an overlap here. What does he mean by... I think he's not saying they have to happen. The, the, the he's not, it's not the first one, because it's about the impact of the... It's about the impact of the delay rather than the timing of the delay. But I think it's probably quite difficult to argue that there is equal causative potency if the timing is different. Do you, do you follow? So if, if, if delay event, if, if the contractor event happens on in, in the second week of the project and the employer delay happens in the sixth week of the project, there could be concurrent delay if, if there is a link, but it's quite difficult to see how you could argue that given the, the difference in time. At the same time, if they both happen at the same time, you're still looking at how they knock out the critical path at the end is probably easier, I'd have thought, if they're happening at the same time because it's just, it's just easier to discuss it. Um, but it's probably halfway between the two because he's not looking at the timing of the, he's not looking at the timing of the uh, underlying events. He's looking at the impact, but at the same time, it must be quite difficult to argue for an impact where the events are very separate in time. And this is partly my philosophy on concurrent delay and how you, you, you prove it is it does come down to a bit of storytelling and argumentation and narrative about how you demonstrate it. Um, if you look at the, and this is possibly the Scottish approach in City Inn, which is the leading Scottish decision, um, the judges in that case uh, were confronted, I think, with the one expert essentially had a very almost rough and ready uh, set of evidence of how to present the delays that happened. And the other expert had, you know, all the, the window, all the technical 
uh, delay analysis kit. And the judges, I think, much preferred the, the simple, easy to understand, rough and ready approach because they, as judges, at the end of the day, could follow what was being told to them, whereas all the time slice and all that, I'm not saying it was time slice, but all that kind of, yeah. the Gantt charts, and that, that's where my mind goes blank, all the Gantt charts just, they couldn't follow it. So at the end of the day, it comes down to a question of who are you trying to prove this to? And I think this narrower definition will mean that a judge who doesn't really want to get into the subject matter will say, well, this isn't current concurrent delay because approximately equal would have to be, you know, it would, it's quite easy for a judge to say it's not approximately equal. It's probably this more than this. So I think this is, this is in one of those situations where you have a judgment which is about a lot of big things, but actually one of the biggest things in it is its, its approval at court of appeal level of this narrow definition, because I think that will cut down quite a lot of the actual cases where concurrent delay becomes an option. And then actually to preempt a, a, a future slide, that point combined with the fact that they've accepted that you can contract out of concurrent delay means you are unlikely to get concurrent delay because it will be easy enough now to contract out of it because you can just include a standard term in your contract. And those cases where they've not contracted out of it, a judge is likely to be able to say this isn't concurrent delay. So the questions around concurrent delay and the interaction with the prevention principle are likely to be shunted off to relatively narrow uh, fact situations. And that means that any of these, uh, well not any, but a lot of these existing issues um, might not be heard in the courts because there may not be a sufficiently clear-cut case to really test them out. But issues then, such as this interaction between Jackson and Lewison, may not get resolved as quickly because there aren't going to be, isn't going to be a court decision to resolve them. One of the problems for me as a Scottish lawyer is, and we'll come on to this, there isn't any authority in Scotland about the prevention principle particularly. So a Scottish court may decide to go with the Lewison definition, even though the English courts seem to broadly prefer the Jackson definition. And that is something we will come back to. So that's, that's the definition of concurrent delay. When it happens um, is Walter Lilly against Mackay, uh, and that applies in Wales as well. And in, that, in England and Wales, you have a situation where um, if there is a relevant event, then the contractor has an entitlement to an extension of time, whether or not that's concurrent with another cause of delay. And that's different from the Scottish position. I found about the most Scottish picture I could find. Uh, that's different from the Scottish position, where essentially the, the, uh, the, the judge or the architect making the decision can apportion the delay between both parties on a fair and reasonable basis. Now, I, I've seen scholarship that suggests that this is more internationally acceptable as a, a solution, that the English approach is actually out of step. However, the Scottish jurisdiction, as, a, as the smaller partner, uh, is often under pressure to, to come to meet the, the English approach. So um, we will see. But I think it is relevant in terms of discussions about the pre prevention principle because it shows specifically that although I think it's generally fair to talk about UK construction law as a whole, there is a distinct difference of approach between England and Scotland in this particular narrow area. Is there an act of prevention if there's concurrent delay? Uh, this was rather skated over by the judge in Sidon because the question is, is there an act of prevention if there's concurrent delay? On the one hand, yes, they've been prevented, so there should be an extension of time. But on the other hand, if the contractor wasn't going to complete because he was in delay anyway, then there is no act of prevention. And nobody's quite worked that out yet. And again, because of the, because of the two issues which I've picked up er earlier, which I've called the side and siding, um, it may well be that this issue doesn't come before the courts particularly quickly. To circle back to the initial questions then, now we've looked at these recent cases. Uh, we have this position where 
Uh, we have, it may well be an implied term. The prevention principle may well be an implied term. The nature of that implied term is not altogether clear. Um, for example, there's been academic writing suggest it may be, it's a rule of construction, i.e. it's a way of interpreting the contract rather than a specific term which is impliedly written into the contract. And I think the underlying question, and this might reflect my Scottish uh, mixed system brain, it wants to know what the underlying principle is that us underpins where the implied term comes from. Where does the implied term come from? The rule of law analysis seems to have been ruled out. Um, so then there's a question, well, what is it? And then the question of when it arises um, is still unclear from Lewis and uh, the Lewis and Jackson debate is still, is still um, somewhat live. The question then is, could good, help, good faith help this? I think this is particularly interesting because what you see here is an area where there is the common law developing through case law and testing against different sorts of scenarios and gradually working towards solutions that then are applicable elsewhere. But that process of working towards a solution and testing out scenarios, I think is showing you that there may be something underneath uh, which helps to explain what is going on. It's a bit like if, if I was standing here and somebody threw a lot of paint at me and then my outline was against the wall, you would see the paint as the outline, but you wouldn't see, you'd just see the blank space where I had been standing. And to some extent, I think good faith could be this blank space. It's, it, you know it was there, but you only see it by what's spattered around it. You don't talk about the, the good faith in the middle. The other thing that's important is that in English law recently, uh, since about 2013, there have been a significant number of cases where the idea of good faith in, uh, in contracts generally has been under discussion, uh, and a particularly significant case last year where um, the incidents of good faith were really brought out. So there is, uh, in the NEC standard form of contract, mutual trust and cooperation, so an express term of good faith. So it's recognized it's possible for parties to have this in their contract, but the underlying question is, well, what does it mean? What does, you know, what is the definition? What does it mean people actually have to do? Um, a recent case last year where there was some quite clear setting out of some of those parameters of if there was an obligation of good faith, uh, what it actually means. Uh, and that's seen in this case, uh, which is massive. Um, it's a, uh, the, the good faith discussion for purposes of uh, referencing is from about page, paragraph 720 of judgment number three of at least six in this saga between Bates and the post office. Uh, it relates to the relationship which the British post office had with the people who ran the various post offices in its network. There were some problems with the software, which meant that the people running the post offices who make their money through the post office services that they run as a franchise essentially, lost a lot of money. And so they claimed against the post office for these breaches of the software. That's relevant because the discussion in good faith in the recent English uh, common law, and there's been one or two Scottish decisions too, focus on the idea of the relational contract, which is a contract where the relationship between the parties is integral. And this, the discussion in Bates against the post office was whether this was a relational contract, and if it was a relational contract, was there good faith? And if there was good faith, what did that actually mean? And that then brings out some quite useful uh, dicta about the definition of both relational contracts uh, and the definition of good faith uh, in English law. In terms of that point about good faith in English law, then in paragraph 721, uh, the judge said, uh, there is no general duty of good faith in commercial contracts. And that, that, I think, is different, just for clarity. I think it's different from the bit where the splatter reveals something. I think there may well be some philosophical good faith underpinning the thinking in the common law, but there's no general duty of good faith, is what the judge said in Bates, uh, in all commercial contracts. But such a duty could be implied into some contracts uh, where it was in accordance with the presumed intention of the parties. And those contracts were uh, what were called relational contracts, which is um, something which is decided, which is heavily dependent on the context as well as the terms of the party's relationship. 
and that is the context which decides whether the contract is relational or not. So we have then in Bates, although this is just a first instance decision, I think the case is settled, so I don't think unfortunately it's going to an appeal. Um, we have quite a clear stand, uh, 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 setting out that there is an implied duty of good faith in English relational contracts. That then obviously takes one amorphous term of good faith and replaces another, which is what is a relational contract? And this quote says it has to be very contextually determined. Luckily, um, and this is quite small writing, I suspect, for some of you, the judge also set out what he thought were the criteria for a relational contract. And so he said, and, and he said that these aren't individually determinative, but the first one is relevant, which is there's nothing express to prevent an implication of good faith. There has to be a long-term contract with mutual intention. Uh, the respective roles have to be performed with integrity and fidelity to the bargain. There has to be a commitment to collaboration in the performance of the contract. Uh, and as we go through this, think about construction contracts and do they fit these criteria? They have to have spirit and objectives of the venture which may not be capable of being expressed exhaustively in the written contract. The parties have trust and confidence in each other, but do not have a fiduciary relationship, so it's not like a partnership or a, something like that. There has to be a high degree of communication, cooperation, and predictable performance based on mutual trust and confidence and expectations of loyalty. There has to be a significant investment or substantial financial commitment by one or both of the parties. And there may also be exclusivity of the relationship. So for the construction lawyer, there is a question there about whether uh, a construction contract will fit those criteria. And I don't think it, I mean, I think that there may be somewhere it does, but at the same time, there may well be somewhere it doesn't. In terms of the academic background for relational contracts, relational contracts, um, the idea is that they are different from classical one-off transactional contracts. So if I go to the shop and buy um, a bag of rice, uh, and if I went to the shop downstairs and bought a bag of rice and then went off, that would be a, almost a classic relational contract because it's very unlikely that I will buy another bag of rice from that shop uh, in the very near future. There is no relationship between me and the person selling the rice. So that would be a, a classic contract. On the other end of the spectrum is the sort of things that are in the case law, which is long-term agency agreements where parties are working together over a long period of time uh, on a number of transactions. And they are seen as very relational because it's all about the relationship. Construction contracts to me sit at least somewhere in the middle because you have some of that long-term emphasis on the relationship which you have in these relational cases, but also you have, at the end of the day, the completion and delivery of a thing, which is the project, and that in some ways bears a, some resemblance, at least, to the bag of rice transaction. And looking at these criteria, I don't think you could with confidence say that every construction contract would be a relational contract, which means that some construction contracts at least may not have implied duties of good faith in them. That is a point which we'll come back to. The other thing that this case was important was that it carved out as a separate implied term the rule in Sterling against Maitland. And the rule against Sterling against Maitland is the one on the, uh, is the, one on the slide. Now, the reference to the rule against Sterling is Maitland seems to be almost used as a shorthand in this judgment, but it's not something that seems to pop up, at least in the construction law literature. But the rule in Sterling against Maitland is essentially the prevention principle. So, you have a situation here where you have relational contracts have good faith, but that is a different question from whether or not there is a prevention principle. So in Bates, essentially, although they've not discussed it in those construction law terms, you have relational contracts as one set of potential implied terms, and then the implication of the rule in Sterling against Maitland for other implied terms. And this is the prevention principle. So here the prevention principle is separated from the implied duties of good faith. And again, that's not to say the splatter effect doesn't come in to inform why you have the rule in Sterling against Maitland. The judge in that case, and that's a picture of him, may have been in informed by some underlying ideas of good faith. Is everyone with me?
There was then a further case which actually dealt with the word prevention principle in specific terms and linked it with the rule in Sterling against Maitland, which is helpful. Unfortunately, the decision was not particularly clear, but the arguments, I think, are quite clarifying, at least for me. So, in that case, they argued that the prevention, there was a prevention principle application either because it was a relational contract or on the basis of the prevention principle as it stands in implied term. In doing so, it's worth noting that they cited the Lewison definition of the prevention principle. And then, arguing against it, they said, in this particular circumstances, there was no relational contract. And then, that if there was a prevention principle, it, it's, it was an implied term which came from the test of business efficacy. Does everyone know what that is? It's necessary for that contract to work. Okay. That's the There's an implied term where the parties haven't written something into the contract, but um, there is a test about whether or not it's something that would have been so obvious um, or so necessary for the operation of the contract that they would have included those terms. So they're saying here that the prevention, the prevention principle, if there is not a relational contract, would need to meet the test of efficacy in order to exist. Now that was an argument, that's not the decision, but that is a, again, a situation where I don't think you could necessarily say that that would apply to a construction contract because it may not be necessary for the construction contract that you have the prevention principle. You could argue differently and we may come on to that in a bit. So we have a separation of the prevention principle for good faith as, a, as implied duties we have questions about where that implied term comes from and that I think leaves us in a bit of a quandary about what to do for construction. Because if a construction contract isn't a relational contract, what is the basis for the prevention principle? Is it the implied term basis, which is what Coulson says in North Midland? But if it is an implied term, then if you read those two decisions together, the, uh, the SPI North and uh, North Midland, the implied term may be one that comes from a concept of necessity. And again, for the Scottish lawyer, that is evolving because you have cases about post offices, you have cases about construction, you have cases where there's a discussion and a dispute about what's in the pleadings, and each one edges towards a slightly different answer, but there's no, what is the, what is the, the what is in this blank? And the Scots lawyer, I think, likes to know what's in the blank. <coughs> So we're a mixed system, but that doesn't mean say that we like everything mixed up. We like to be able to pull out the various ingredients. And I think then if you're looking at a civil code, similarly, you want to, see, you want to be able to trace back to wha what in the civil code would be giving you this situation. And I think with the English position, it would be quite difficult to work out exactly where the civil code would deal with it based on these various arguments. And I think actually the sort of thing which would benefit from somebody sitting down and working out right, what is it? Okay, I have a interesting case about business efficacy. Yeah. Uh, for example, the design clause. Sometimes, uh, uh, and maybe maybe prevention principles can be applied to this. Sometimes, uh, for example, in the title, the, in construction, the, the design or the code requires for example. 10% on the RP uh, generation. And this is the economics of the, how this uh, kind of design works. But some, for some reason, a lot, a lot of defects occur, for example, and the employer wants to extend to 100%. So the, the, the business itself, the business goals, mm -hmm. that it needs only 10% because the whole uh, construction industry knows that there will be a defect. But sometimes employer doesn't, does not know that this is what is impacting. Yes. So this is efficacy. I mean, the, the, the business, the, the employer does not know that the efficacy or the business uh, efficiency is good and 
Yes, and I think that actually picks up quite clearly the one of the tensions that exists in another part of contract law is the extent to which the courts will consider the context of the contract interpreting it and the question of how much do the, part, the, the courts hold the parties to the specific words in their contract and how much do they say, well, that's, that's ridiculous, you can't have meant to say that. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot, there's the, the, the UK Supreme Court and the House of Lords before it over the last 15, 20 years have swung quite dramatically from one side of that to, to the other. Uh, so there's a case of Chartbrook against Persimmon where the uh, Lord Hoffman was trying to argue and successfully argued in the judgment there that the factual matrix, the, the, con the, the context of the contract meant that the court should be quite interventionist in interpreting what the contract really meant. And that swung back to more recent case law, in particular Arnold against Britain, uh, where they have said much more clearly that they will hold the parties to... Uh, the, bar the, the bargain that they have agreed in the contract, that's the primary evidence at least of what the party's intentions were. And I think when you look at this issue about the relational contract and the prevention principle and business efficacy, there would be at least a question about whether it's business efficacy to apply the prevention principle in a particular contract, whereas in construction generally it's now understood and it, it sort of underpins how construction contracts uh, are written, that there is this prevention principle, so you have to have the extension of time mechanism. And that extension of time mechanism has to be pretty comprehensive in terms of what it picks up. So if we look at Scots law, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and canter through this because I'm aware that we are a small jurisdiction, but there are some in interesting points. Um, the first one is this Id an idea of equitable adjustment. Now in English legal system they have the role of equity was a separate jurisdiction the courts had and that allows the, the court to make some more flexible judgments in certain situations the Scottish system didn't have that jurisdiction equity a bit like good faith was something that sort of underpinned it but it wasn't an express duty generally but in this case of Lloyd's TSB against Lloyd's banking group which is a similar situation here which was that the fo Lloyd's TSB foundation were given money by the banking group over a period of time, but the uh, accounting rules upon which that donation was ch uh, was based changed in such a way that the foundation lost a lot of money. And so they went to court to try and say, well, we, we, we the contract really means that we still get the same amount of money. Uh, the amount of money was significant, so uh, they went all the way to the UK Supreme Court. At the end of the day, the court said, actually, no, the way that you interpret the contract is clear and you get the money that you are supposed to get. You don't get any adjustments. But as this case went through the courts, there was an argument that the Scottish courts have a jurisdiction called equitable adjustment where if there is, if there is a change of circumstances, which mean that the intention of the parties in the contract um, are not uh, the are, are, are not quite frustrated, so not quite ended, but significantly impeded, then the court would have some ability to essentially change the terms of the agreement. And that would be based on equity, which would be something that you could again see as something in this underlying idea of good faith. Just slightly lost my thread. <laughs> so, and if you look at then the construction contract side, you have a situation where Something has happened in the course of the construction contract and things have changed. So it's not quite that the contract is brought to an end because of those changing circumstances, but it's almost, it's getting to that stage. So the prevention principle could be seen as the contract is not going to be performed as contracted for because the completion date has been missed for reasons which aren't the contractor's fault. Could this process of equitable adjustment apply to allow the contract terms to be changed to something reasonable? Could that be the route by which you would imply the existence of the prevention principle in Scots law? Because the parties have contracted to complete on day X, something happens which prevents completion of day X, the courts use their equitable adjustment to say, well, that's in all the circumstances, it's fair that actually day Y, which is a reasonable time, is the completion date. There, that would be the way the prevention principle would work, and that would fit with a rule, an underpinning rule, drawing on good faith in Scots law. <coughs> 
you'll see if you've read the quote from Lord Hope that he does not like that. He says that um, that is no longer, um, that is not part of Scots law. Couldn't be much clearer, unfortunately. Academics like to find a little nuance, but there's nothing there. To hold otherwise, we undermine the principle enshrined in the maxim pacta sunt servanda, which means the terms of the contract rule, uh, which lies at the root of the whole law of contract. So fundamental to Scots law is what the contract says uh, in Lord Hope's judgment here. That poses a problem if you took that relatively conventional analysis of how the prevention principle might arise in Scots law. And it does so in a way that doesn't really recognise any idea of underlying good faith. <coughs> but it seems to me that the prevention principle, if there was a case in Scotland, they would want to talk about the prevention principle, especially if it was construction related, because it is something which is very important in UK construction. My, help, my understanding of this was then helped by flagging up these provisions of the Egyptian Civil Code. Because I thought to myself, if you think of these, these, are, these aren't, univer these aren't um, particular Egyptian values. These are values that are you know, intrinsic to most uh, contractual systems. But they help because in that civil law way, they pull out the underlying ideas uh, and express them in quite a good way. So there's the idea of contributory loss. And um, uh, Article 215 as well is uh, about specific performance um, uh, and non-performance. And Scots law, unlike English law, is more keen on specific performance than English law, which tends to go to damages. So the idea of keeping your promise is seen, at least by Scots lawyers, as something that's more intrinsic within our system than in English law, where they tend to take a more financial view and they're more, they're generally at least in the stereotype, happier to hear about getting damages. What you would do to pull those back is look at the idea in Scots law of mutuality. And the way that mutuality is expressed is almost exactly the way that um, Lord Justice Jackson, Sir Rupert Jackson, expressed the prevention principle's essence as being not being able to prosecute a claim against one side when they themselves are in breach of contract. So something that underpins the whole idea of contract in Scotland is the idea of mutuality. Um, that gives rise to two essential outcomes, which are uh, the self-help remedy of retention uh, and contributory negligence. Contributory negligence essentially as, is almost as the uh, Article 216. You can reduce the damages if uh, there is a degree of fault by the person claiming them. Um, but in Scots law, that is largely legislative, so it doesn't really help in terms of this picking apart the bones of the system. Self-help retention has some appeal. Uh, that is essentially where you can withhold performance uh, if the other party is in breach, uh, and it is explicitly linked in the case law with building contracts. So the, the classic is not paying uh, if the other party has not completed fully what the contract says. Now, obviously, there's often carve-outs there exa on exactly what that means. But the basic situation is if you aren't getting paid, you do not have to work, and you can operate this as a self-help remedy. You don't have to go to court. The problem with it, and, and that has a, I could see a route from self-help retention to the prevention principle because it relies on this idea of mutuality. But I think the, the way the rule works is only temporary, it needs to be something that's resolvable. Both of those things suggest that actually the prevention principle type thing no longer fits because once you've missed a completion date, you can't go back in time yet and fix it. So that doesn't mean you, you, could, you could then operate your retention in perpetuity and that isn't really what the retention's about. It's there to compel performance rather than punish non-performance. Um, and there are questions about the materiality of the breach, um, which I think mean that questions about the prevention principle get a bit lost which then led me to a little bit of a, uh, a sticking point. Uh, and then I discovered uh, an old Scottish case which is actually cited in just about every contract law textbook I could find, but doesn't use the word prevention principle and hasn't been cited in court. Uh, it's been cited in court. I've found one reference since 1916. But those discussions don't really go into these underlying details about what the principle is. 
But if you look at the judgment, you see that each of the judges has a slightly different basis for it. And so in terms of unpicking what they're thinking about, um, it's quite a useful way to think about how the prevention principle might work, uh, both in terms of Scots law, but also because it's this broader policy-based discussion in terms of English law and, uh, and elsewhere. So there were three judges. The first one is Lord Dundas. Uh, he said essentially it was an implied term, uh, which was a condition precedent. In this case, TNR Duncanson, um, there were various work packages. I think it was building this street. The age of those houses is about right for the case. I'm not 100% sure, but this is certainly the street where it happened. There were various work packages. Um, I think it was the joiner. The joiner had a contractual completion date but as things transpired, they didn't even get on site before the contractual completion date was, was passed. So a pretty classic prevention principle situation there. Lord Dundas said there was an implied condition precedent. Um, I'll let you have these slides afterwards so you can read them. Lord Salveson said, Lord Salveson put the case which we don't often hear in prevention principle terms of why parties should be kept to what they've bargained for. But he said in this situation, the contractor has signed up to a certain completion date. And so it all behoves them to meet that date and to take steps to uh, make sure that they can do it. So if they've foolishly allowed themselves to contract in such a way that they are stuck with a date that they can't meet, then that is the contractor's fault rather than the employer's fault. And that if there, is a, if there is a loss and a breach, then they should find the person who's actually in breach rather than simply trying to rely on the prevention principle to get them out of the, the contract that they've signed up for. Now, he said that, uh, but he then said in this particular case that the situation was uh, impossible for them and so the impossibility essentially an equitable adjustment type position a change in circumstances meant that um, they shouldn't be held to the completion date so we have Lord Dundas talking about an implied term and an implied term basis was what essentially was argued before the court we have Lord Salveson looking at some sort of impossibility argument where it's the change of circumstances has driven the solution and we have the third judge, Lord Guthrie, who decided on the basis of an implied term, but then decided, and that was because that was what the parties had argued before him, and then said there's a simpler view, which as I read it essentially is going to an idea of mutuality, that the underlying idea of the contract is both parties do what they should be doing, and if they don't, then the contract should be changed to accommodate that. And so it's some sort of, it's something intrinsic in the idea of contract between two parties that is about two parties working together. And again, that idea, I think, is something that has a good faith type idea within it, this, this slightly more flexible approach, acknowledging the reality of the relationship between the parties uh, to getting to the right situation. Is everyone with me still? We're into, the, we're into the final bit. So having thought of all that, uh, and if you like Harry Potter films, this is a Harry Potter. <laughs> the, the situation is beginning to drive me around the bend. We have three approaches in that case. We have something around the change of circumstances and, and impossibility, but I think that's the one which would be scuppered by equitable adjustment ruling in the Supreme Court just in 2013 that says, no, the contract is paramount. And that says we then have to be looking at what the contract is in order to try and work out what the answer is. That takes us to some sort of implied term argument, I think, because Pacta Sunt Servanda does not exclude implied terms where that's appropriate. But the question then comes back down to what sort of implied term is it and where does it come from? Uh, that's just the, the slides. And one of the things that is forgotten and hasn't been argued yet is that there is, in the cases, is that there's more than one type of implied term the BNP Paribas uh, business efficacy implied term is the one that there's usually a lot of debate about because that's one where you require the judges to make a decision about what the reasonable commercial person 
will think the position is. But there are other implied terms which are implied into particular classes of contractual relationship, as I said in this case, uh, such as being landlord and tenant, employer and employee, um, uh, and where the parties have left a good deal unsaid, but the courts have implied the term is necessary because it's part of that class of contract. And I think actually that is still quite a narrow way of looking at it because if you look at the textbooks and you look at the discussions of implied terms, there isn't just uh, implied terms of uh, business efficacy and, business and, and of class, but there is uh, terms which imply by a previous course of dealing. If you've always contracted on one basis and then the, the next contract in the sequence doesn't apply, uh, refer to that term, then it could be implied, it may not be, but it depends on the facts, but it could be implied there. There's a step out then, you know, if you think about it, it starts with what is necessary for making this contract work, and as the parties in this contract understood the situation, it then looks at what has happened based on the previous interactions between these parties, that's another type of implied term. There's then the one that's referred to in the previous slide about a class of contract, and then there is, um, well, that might be it. But anyway, there's they, they step out from the narrow to the class of contract to then the overall rules of law. So you see with the relational contracts now, something that is an overall rule of law about a particular category of contract. You have then particular types of contracts such as uh, landlord and tenant or employer employee ones. You then have a uh, course of dealing between those parties and then you then have uh, uh, what's necessary for this particular type of contract. So it's not so much just uh, one of two options, but really, uh, as the slide indicates, a spectrum. And that's not just me that says that. That's something the UK House of Lords decided in the 70s in Liverpool against Irwin. There's really a spectrum of implied terms. And I think if you think of implied terms in that sense, you can start to see things like the rule in Sterling against Maitland and relational contracts, sit on this spectrum rather than as being particularly exclusive sorts of term. This may also explain a difference of approach in construction contracts from um, other forms of commercial contracts because you may say that construction contracts fit within a particular class. Now that argument has not been made yet. That is an argument that would have to be made. People like me spend quite a lot of time trying to justify that construction law is a separate body of law in its own right that sort of argument would need to be run to say that there is specific implied terms that apply in construction law, but don't apply in other forms of commercial contract. And I think there are good arguments for that, and I think that would have a reasonable prospect if you were to try and run them, but I think that is, that is where you're going. So I'm, I'm, I'm currently coalescing around the idea of construction contracts having a specific construction prevention principle. That, however, isn't that satisfactory for me as a Scottish lawyer because that's a very, that's a piecemeal ad hoc solution to a particular issue. If there is an implied term, what is it? I've just been arguing for the custom and practice one that it's just a way that's understood within the sector that this is how contracts work. Other options we'd, that I've seen argued are that it comes from a, a general duty to cooperate that if you breach your duty to cooperate, then the mutuality kicks in by saying, if you're breaching your duty to cooperate, then you cannot hold other people to their obligation. And then I think the other thing is that it's just drawn from this underlying idea of good faith from the gap where the paint spatters round it, linked probably in Scots law at least to the idea of mutuality, that this is something that's intrinsic to the contract itself. And that's where the implied term comes from. The difficulty with those arguments is that you have your equitable adjustment point from Lord Hope. Um, but I think probably if you were to talk about implied terms rather than equitable rules, you would have, uh, you could thread that particular needle. Concurrency in this situation, uh, I haven't quite got my head around it again yet. Uh, Max Twivy wrote the Hudson Prize winning essay. He says that, um, if there's an act of prevention, then there should be an extension of time, but he sort of ignores the circularity of it that there's only prevention if they've actually been prevented and if there's concurrent delay, then they may not have been prevented because the, the, cause, of the, the cause and effect hasn't quite worked out. So I don't think he's quite, I don't think his argument quite stacks up. It's very persuasively written, but I think it runs into the problem with, is there an act of prevention in the first place? 
um, if you think the act of prevention is different from a breach of contract, then there may be differences in terms of the causal effect because if it's, if it's coming from something underlying the contract rather than specific contractual terms, it might be that in certain circumstances that gives rise to a different analysis. I suspect actually the point of concurrency in English law is now relatively dead, just famous last words. Scots law is different because I think there may be, a, there may be a, an attempt in Scotland to try and realign Scots law with English law just for legal system issues uh, in terms of making sure the law is the same in both countries. So we may see some running of the argument there, um, but that's about where I've got to with that. Um, and then, Willie, you thought we were going to yeah, have a break? I forgot to mention something in the uh, introduction. Uh, the program was that uh, after David finishes his, his lecture, we'd have a break for 10 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for questions and answers. So I wanted to ask you all, um, by show of hands, uh, do you th you would you like us to continue with the questions and answers now, or would you like us to have the break for 10 minutes? So uh, how many would like the break for 10 minutes? And then we'll... Uh, okay, how many would like to continue? Okay. Is that? I think the I think the second one was more. Maybe have a break for five minutes. <laughs> okay. <actually. laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 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 So, so let's let's have a break for a very short break, and then we'll uh, resume back with the questions. Where the benefit of the common law. So the common law benefits because you get cases which set like this is bad faith, this is good faith. Is this more like this or this? And you put it here, and then you have here, you know, and you gradually come to an understanding. But you need the cases to happen. One of the problems in Scotland is that we don't have, because it's quite a small country, we don't have the cases. So you're left with, you know, you're left with this 1916 authority, which nobody's ever questioned because it's from 1916. And, and the judges are all. I'm um, sorry, Doctor, we have a special request to take a picture. May, oh, yeah. may, may, may we? Yes. You can stay up. We'll no, stay no, up. I don't like staying We, we don't have a problem. No, behind. <laughs> 